All right, so welcome again, everybody. Uh, my name is Megan Babbitt, and I am the Director of Learning and School Support for, or School Engagement for ORTOP. Um, this is a session that is specifically geared towards the innovative project as part of the um, FLL Challenge um, pro uh, program this year, but um, there are a couple of slides at the beginning to just orient us around pedagogy and remind us of what the, the vision and mission of ORTOP and of FIRST Robotics is. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over that it, those introductory materials. We do have our um, previous workshops uh, available as recordings, and this one will also be up um, at the end of the evening or tomorrow morning as um, both as a recording and as uh, the slide shows the slideshow themselves, the slides themselves. So I will send you that email um, when we have that posted and you'll be able to access everything that you see tonight on the web. Um, so the innovative project is a portion of the overall game, right? So part of the part of the first Lego League challenge is robotics design. We have the robot game, we have the innovative project, and we have um, the core values section as well. Those are the four parts of the program that are judged uh, during a competition or a tournament. Um, You'll hear me say innovation and innovative project. Um, I, I take issue with the grammar of the name of this, of this, um, of this section of, of the program, but it is technically called innovative project overview. So um, just to orient ourselves again, um, ORTOP is the program delivery partner for FIRST, uh, the National uh, LEGO Robotics and um, FIRST Tech um, Robotics program. And so FIRST has a vision, which is, is pretty broad to transform our culture where science, by creating a world where science and technology are celebrated. And then in ORTOP, we really focus that on Oregon students and on this idea of community and celebrating STEM thinkers and makers. And so everything we do is, is informed by the idea that we're reaching every student um, and that every student has access and, um, and something to contribute to this community. So one of the taglines that FIRST has, FIRST says, when you build robots, you build community. We say, and this is a quote from one of our alumni, in order to build robots, we first must build community. And again, that, that nuance is really important to us, right? We are focusing on the students first. Um, we, yes, we're, we're a robotics program, but it's really about the kids and about the students and, um, and their process. So robotics is the tool and students are our focus. Um, and also everything we do is informed by this idea of the core values. So um, there are six core values that first embodies and, and you know, you when the kids go for judging, they'll need to talk about how their work, their process, their team embody to these, these values. Um, but also you wanna ask yourself, you know, are we having fun? Because if we're not having fun, I mean, you can be experiencing joy without fun and that's, that's okay, right? Joy is a long-term, um, it's a, it's a long-term experience as opposed to an immediate hit of happy. Um, so we're, we're more than happy to have joy that is inherent in achieving a difficult challenge, but we wanna make sure that there's fun, that there's inclusion, that building of community is happening, we're collaborating, um, and, and, we're, and that the students are really feeling like they are discovering, they are innovating, and that their work has the potential for impact in their community. Um, in addition to core values, you've got two more kind of arching categories of gracious professionalism and cooperation, which means that we are all working together to raise each other up. So even though this is a competitive program, it's also about that collaboration and that team spirit. So as we talk about the innovation or the innovative project tonight, um, the pedagogy behind it is the pedagogy of project-based learning and engineering and design. Um, so 
I'm not going to go too deeply into these tonight. Again, um, as part of our introduction to the program, we we do go much more deeply into project-based learning. But the, the basic thought here is that students are practicing inquiry. They are challenging themselves. Um, they are doing the work. They are coming up with innovative answers. And the adults in the room, so the coaches, the mentors, um, anybody you're bringing in from the community are acting as support for the students' work. And this is not about, um, this is not about regurgitation of information that's already out there, right? We're not actually asking students to, um, to stand in front of the judges at a tournament and, um, and describe you know, what, what they've, the product, what we wanna know is about the process. And so the process is our focus and that's the process of making, that's the process of reflecting and iterating, it's the process of sharing. Um, and, and collaborating and thinking and all of those really wonderful soft skills that we, that we value so much as 21st century skills, but we have so much trouble assessing, um, at least in a traditional educational setting. So um, when you are guiding your students through this project, you're really, you're not only having them do the project, you're having them think about the thinking, they're practicing metacognition and they're doing it in such a way that they're going to be able to talk about it at the end. So um, engineering notebooks are, I believe, part of your team um, packets. And I highly, highly recommend um, supplementing those in any way that makes this process more accessible for the students in front of you. So, you know, having them make audio recordings if writing isn't there, isn't, isn't a way that they're e able to easily express themselves. Lots of pictures, particularly labeled pictures. Um, you know, if you have students who enjoy sketching, that's, a, that's also a way to, to get their ideas out on paper um, or, you know, digitally. But it's, it's that idea of communicating and sharing without being um, boxed in by the medium. So the rubric, when, when you get there, when you get to the judging, the rubric for the innovative project is based on um, five, five elements. And these are also the elements that you're gonna go through. This is the process that you'll go through with your team. So um, first we'll provide you with, the, with kind of a statement or a very general problem. And students need to narrow that down to a clearly defined specific problem and one that they're able to research. And it's, um, it's pretty important that they are doing the work and that they are doing the research and they're looking to see what other answers have, have you know, has anyone tried to answer this question before? Has anyone tried to address the problem that they've identified and is what they're finding um, something that is uh, valuable research or is it sort of something that someone threw up on the web and has no, um, no substance to it? And your, your place in that process is about guidance, not about doing the research for them. So one, one thing that we find is that coaches often want students to define a problem that has a solution that they already know. Um, so that the, you know, the adult in the room can already know the answer um, that the students are seeking. And that is not the purpose of the innovative project. The purpose of the innovative project is for students to really stretch themselves and possibly ask questions that don't have um, solutions that have already been well executed. So it's, it's time to get comfortable with discomfort as the adult in the room and comfortable with saying things like, I don't know that answer, let's go find it together. Um, there is a design element, right, where you have this innovative idea and then you're developing it, you're designing it, that, that engineering process comes in where you're, if there's a prototype, you're testing it. Um, that's also creation and iteration, right? You have to keep trying over and over again. So this should match what your students are doing with their robot and their robot design as well. And then finally is that communication piece. And we are, um, the, the judging is not the, um, 
is not that final communication piece we ask and the judges will want to hear about places where students have communicated what they've done and what they've been doing outside of judging. Um, before I keep going, are there questions? I, um, I saw that we had Chris join us, I believe, and Chris, welcome. Um, I'm gonna keep going, but please raise your hand, um, take yourself off mute. Uh, looks like there's somebody in the chat. Hello. And, um, you know, however you wanna get my attention, you can. I am playing both um, a workshop leader and tech host tonight. So probably it's gonna be easier if you just interrupt me by taking yourself off mute if you have a question. So when we use the word innovative or when we talk about innovation, um, we don't want that word to be a barrier to your students having success. Yes, it can be something completely new, right? So, so when presented with the problem from first and then narrowing down to that specific question that they have, um, your students might, might lean towards a solution that is entirely new. But they also might want to look at an existing solution that's used in a new, innovative way. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about an example of that in a moment. Um, the main thing, again, is to communicate, right? How is this innovative? Is it, is it developing, if it's developing from an, exist, from an existing solution, how is it building on what's already out there? If it's brand new, how do you know it's brand new? Um, so you can also improve upon something that already exists, improving access or awareness is also a possibility. So if, if a solution to the problem is a really good one, but nobody knows about it, how can you, how can you improve that awareness? If a solution to, that exists out there is, um, you know, it's an excellent solution, but nobody can actually access it, they, nobody can use it, then how do you, how do you address that as, a, as, a, um, as an innovative project? And, um, and how do you make it you know, easier to use? So um, there are several examples of former projects that um, have actually been prototyped and implemented. So um, you know, there, are, there were students who um, previously used, looked at um, 3D printing as a way to make um, uh, grippers for um, individuals who had either lost, um, you know, lost limbs or had lost the ability to use their hands um, and were prototyped that and then um, actually got that out into the community. There were um, a couple of years ago, we had a challenge that involved um, access to play structures and there were students who redesigned playgrounds and presented them at their um, at their local community um, and actually got a change to to playgrounds to be more accessible to students who are differently abled so um, and the, there's an example on this presentation that we'll talk about in a minute of of some of the ways that students have um, in the past addressed, things like legislation and recycling. So your, your innovation is, is new and also can build on what's out there. And, um, and it needs to be practical, right? Space age is cool. And, and we really encourage your students to, to think outside of the box, but this is also um, an exercise in, in something that the students are going to go out and do. So, um, I once had a student. We were talking about um, a, about the about homes in areas that were um, prone to flooding, and I had a student suggest putting rockets on the bottoms of all of the houses in the area so they could just you know lift up and hover if it were flooding. And that's the kind of idea in brainstorming that that we love to have students. Um, toss out. And then in, in the research phase, as they're trying to narrow their brainstorming ideas down to one prototype, it became clear that jet providing jet fuel to everybody in a floodplain was going to be exorbitantly expensive and also environmentally impactful in a, in a negative way. So crazy ideas are fine, 
and then you you tack on a little research and you say fantastic please go please go research that and come back to the group and let's talk about whether or not it sounds feasible and and again having students take ownership of that process is a really important piece of the innovative project so a previous season, um, I, the theme was trash, trash trek, right? Reducing, reusing, recycling. And so the challenge that came from headquarters, choose a piece of trash, identify a problem with the way it is currently handled, or and or look for problems with the way we make, transport, store, or turn trash into something new. So it's a broad statement, right? It's there's a lot, a lot of places that you can go with it. And one particular team chose to narrow it down to plastic bags, not only clog landfills, but escape into the environment, endangering animals and destroying habitats. They cause infrastructure damage and water drainage systems and cost our city lots of cities lots of money in repairs. So they took that challenge, which was very broad, they narrowed it down to one particular aspect of the problem. And then from that problem statement, they were able able to, um, to look at a series of possible solutions and then they, they chose one. So this particular team, um, you know, one of the solutions that they looked at was, do we want to, um, do we want to go kind of a very practical route and redesign um, the garbage receptacles or the plastic bag receptacles in public areas so that bags don't get blown away from by the wind and can be um, recycled, you know, in, in, in the places where they're being used publicly. Um, they also looked at what the legislation was in their area and, um, you know, was there space for them to lobby for a, a different um, usage laws around um, not not having bags available in stores, charging for bags, recycling bags only. Um, so they, they looked at kind of two different ways to go. And um, in the end, I believe they went the, the prototype way where they actually redesigned um, receptacles for, for parks to, um, to put plastic bags in so that they were not actually escaping their, their receptacles and endangering animals and, and going into the water drainage systems. So um, with that ex example in mind, I'm going to pause for a minute and, and ask if you have questions or thoughts about how to kind of direct students to narrow down their problem statement. Okay, please do um, ask questions as they come up. So in the process of researching and um, also of thinking about how to share your final project, you're gonna end up contacting professionals, right? So, so when we talk about communicating to the community, it's not just um, your team or even your team and their parents. Um, ideally, it's it's community members, it's industry um, professionals, it's, it's people that you can bring into the conversation and that the students can learn from. Um, some students are able to, um, to you know, be incorporated in um, a local STEM fair or um, you know, present in other, other ways and that is wonderful and, and we encourage that as well. Um, but if it is at all possible to involve um, kind of industry professionals and outside community, your students will very much benefit from, from that exchange of ideas. So, this is an opportunity for kids to interact with adults and see the impact of the kinds of questions that they're asking when, um, when professionals ask similar questions. It also means that you might get um, more mentors and more kind of volunteers for involved with your team. And um, especially now that we're coming out of the, the pandemic and more workplaces are opening, you can always get nice field trips out of it, but again, help students really see the possibility of what's out there um, and where robotics can can kind of lead that, that are unexpected. Um, and as always, gracious professionalism, anybody that your team makes contact with, that they work with, you know, please do remember to thank them. Um, 
you know, send pictures if that's something that you have permission to do or, you know, thank you cards or whatever um, feels appropriate. And another, um, another place where community members can help are um, as advisors to your team. So again, in the, in the example that we had about, um, about trash and particularly looking at, at plastic bags in public spaces, bringing in an urban planner, bringing in you know, um, somebody from the, the um, clean water uh, management or from um, Parks and Rec or any of the, the kind of agencies that are going to be involved, any of the professionals that are going to be involved in solving this problem um, in real time in the real world. They can act as advisors for your team as well as people who are acting as sounding boards as your team comes up with ideas. So, you know, questions that you can ask your advisor, that your advisor can help your team ask and research, things like implementation, challenges, a cost benefits analysis. Um, if, if your team goes in a direction of something that people are going to use, there's a usability piece, right? So um, there was a year where um, we had a team who were, who was looking for a solution for, um, for people who had um, who had lost vision um, either either partially or completely, so they were looking to work with the the blind community. And in order to to have an understanding of of what they were even addressing, they needed to reach out to members of that community to ask questions, to help them with the research, and then to test their prototype afterwards. Um, and again, doing that with, with sensitivity and thought and also respect is very important and, and embodies that gracious professionalism and, um, and the, the uh, underlying values of FIRST. So um, we really encourage as much as possible um, you know, site visits, face-to-face -face contact, that kind of thing. But one of the things that, that we've seen as a, a silver lining, a benefit of the pandemic is everybody's on, um, everybody's on video conferencing software of one kind or another. And so any way that you can bring in um, those advisors, potential users, community members, industry professionals, um, that there's a benefit to it. And, and particularly, if you look at the makeup of your team and there are students that would fall into the category of um, um, you know, populations that are underrepresented in STEM or that are underserved by STEM education and looking to see is there any way to get some, somebody in front of your students who looks like them, who is a professional in this field, that is particularly impactful. So as your team is brainstorming possible solutions with the help of an advisor, with your guidance, remember that all, all solutions are game, right? Physical, social, legislative, virtual, um, there's, there's no realm that is unreasonable. So when you're first starting that brainstorming process, all, all ideas have, you know, have value and merit, and then it's, it's about narrowing them down. Um, and questions that you can ask as you start to narrow down um, the possibilities are what technologies are needed, are they currently available, um, you know, or are they imaginary, or or the, in the realm of science fiction, they have yet to be developed. Are they are they developed but not widely available, and is that going to impact the ability of this innovation to be used? Um, and so. You're going to narrow it down and and select a handful to be more thoroughly researched before your team fully decides. So much like choosing a team name, this is an exercise in consensus, right? So so when you choose a team name, you know it can take. I mean, depending on the size of your team, it can take kids many team sessions together to come to consensus. And the process of doing that is valuable because it teaches them how to be collaborative and it teaches them you know, how to work in, in ways and areas that they might be initially resistant or um, with people that are initially resistant. So 
as tempting as it may be to have a heavy hand in this process, remember your role is to guide the students into their um, into their space. So they are doing the hard work of coming to consensus, of making collaborative choices, and of accepting that not everybody's choice is going to, to become not just the final one, but one of the finalists, right? So you start out with any idea, right? Just throw out as many ideas as you can. Every idea has merit. Um, if you can if you can do it on a big piece of paper, um, I actually recommend that because it's durable or you know, in some way make it visible to everybody at the same time. You have a giant list and then you start the process of narrowing it down, asking these questions of you know, what's needed, what's, what's available, is does this seem reasonable, right? How accessible is this going to be? Narrow, narrow, narrow. And then once you've narrowed it down to two or three, that's when the deep research begins. And you can have students break into teams so that each of the, the teams is, is researching deeply one of the ideas and bringing it back to the group with more information so that the final, um, the final idea is chosen. Um, in a way that is equally informed um, by, by research that's been done. Questions about the process and the importance of consensus building? Sorry, Megan, what is Star Trek style solutions? <laughs> Um, so Star Trek style solutions are, are science fiction solutions, right? They're solutions that depend on technology that has yet to be invented, but sounds like a really great idea. Um, so, you know, if, if we, um, if we think about, um, you know, if we think about inner space travel, right? It's, it's a fantastic thought as a way to address population issues, but also the technology just isn't there yet. So, so it's not, it, you know, it's not going to be accessible. It's, you know, building a biome on the moon, on the moon is going to be far out enough as a, as a solution that the, the scope of that solution is, is probably too much for this particular project. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Thank you. Okay. Um, so as students are researching to narrow down those final choices into the, the one project that they're going to work on all together, um, and then as they're, they're um, creating their innovation project itself, we wanna to remember to answer the basics, the who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, and that that is absolutely, I mean, just those basics are, are absolutely necessary for judging um, because the judges haven't been on this journey with your team. So reminding your team that the judges need to know everything that, um, that they already know or that they feel might be obvious, right? You need to have that introduction that, that grounds the problem statement in, in the, the kind of surrounding context that your team is steeped in. Um, you also want to really take a hard look at that cost benefit um, analysis, right? What is it actually going to cost if you're manufacturing or if you have a prototype or even if you're if you're going a little more theoretical or if you're going legislative, what what is the cost, right? It's time, it's, it's money, it's materials. Is there something that's you know, environmental, that's an offset. Um, and if there's a high cost, it doesn't mean that it's a no, but that needs to be rationalized. Um, you know, why is it, why is it better to go with something that's high cost than to go with a lower cost solution? Is it more durable? Is it, um, you know, is it more environmentally sound? Is it um, more accessible, even though it, it costs more is it more accessible in the end? So all of these are reasons to go with a higher cost solution, but your, your kids need to be able to present those and to, to kind of understand the trade-off. Um, 
and to also understand that that especially if they're you know if they're suggesting something that is um, that is going to be widely used or widely implemented in their community that they're hoping will be widely implemented in their community that um, they really they really do need to address you know why why spend public money that way or um, you know why why have it be funded for accessibility in that way. So once your um, once your team has narrowed down through that deep dive research into their final, you know, not only their problem statement but their final innovation idea, um, that's when we really go into the engineering process. So you start, especially if you're prototyping, you start with a sketch, you start with a drawing. Um, you can then move into a three dimensional place, right? Cardboard, wood. Legos, always available. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to be, it needs to be a functional prototype in the sense of the, there needs to be a way for students to see what possible pitfalls are going to be and then work to address those. Um, you know, drawings are fine, but, but three-dimensional prototypes are better if you can manage it. Um, and those prototypes and drawings should really show a solution, show function, um, and also identify challenges. Now, obviously, if you're looking at something like, um, you know, a, a legislative solution, prototyping is going to look different. It's going to look like um, maybe a press kit of, you know, letters to your legislature, or it could, you know, or, or um, you know, possibly pushing out images and um, and text for PSAs. Um, but whatever it is, your students need to look and, and iterate, right? Here's, here's our first possible solution. Here's how we think it will work. Here's how it doesn't work as well as we thought it would. So here's what we're gonna go back and change. And if you can, if you can show that change cycle, right? So having students keep track um, just like they do for robot design um, in an engineering notebook or in some sort of portfolio is really helpful when they have to go back and, and really think about their process. Um, so a couple of, of notes about the judging process, right? Your, your team is going to pour their heart and soul and you know, sweat, blood and tears into, into everything that you do this season. Um, and they're gonna get in front of the judges and it's still, you know, they, they still might not score the points that they hope to. Now, you know, our, our tournaments and our competition, it's really about the process, whether we're talking robot design or the innovative um, project. So they're going to come away having learned. They're going to come away excited about the next time. They're going to be thinking about what, what they could have done or what they could do next in a very positive way. And they really need to communicate their ideas to the judges. So practicing, very useful, right? Having, I mean, students don't have to do kind of a traditional school presentation. They don't have to do what I'm doing right now, which is the equivalent of stand and deliver and is frankly very boring. Um, you know, they can do sketches, they can make a video, they can have visuals and examples. We mm -hmm. are planning to be in person this year, hopefully. Um, I mean, we're definitely planning for that. And so we are really excited to get students and judges in the same room again so that judges could touch and feel and see. Um, um, anything that the students bring in. Um, and, and if you don't share the whole process, if your students, you know, if your students decide that some piece of what they did just wasn't interesting enough to share, then the judges don't know about it. And the judges are there to hear student thinking and, and that, you know, to hear about the learning that happened and the excitement that went on in those rooms that they were not, they weren't privileged enough to be in. So really, push your students to talk about process, push your students to talk about learning, right? Push your students to talk about all of the ways that they failed because those are really, really interesting and the learning is happening and it's so precious. Um, 
And as we get closer to, to competition, um, you know, please reach out to the judging team for clarification. Um, there's always advice that people are willing to give, but they're not going to give you answers. And for something like this, there, there isn't a, a formula for absolute success. Um, but they are, um, you know, the volunteers, our, our volunteer corps is really dedicated to student success and um, to this program. So they are happy to talk to you about, about what's happening and, and offer suggestions um, without telling you that, that there's any guarantee. So um, the final piece of this, and it's a bummer, is your team has five minutes to present all of this. Um, and that includes, uh, you know, if they make a video ahead of time and it's a two minute video, suddenly they only have three minutes to talk after that. So it is a five minute portion of judging. It is very short for something that takes um, so much effort and leads to so much growth. Um, and remember that you wanna cover all of these areas in, in judging and you wanna address all of them as well as um, demonstrate how the team is embodying the first values and gracious professionalism and cooperation. Uh, so it's a, it's a big ask, just like every other part of this program, it's a big ask and it's worth it. Um, it is absolutely worth it. So I believe that is the end of the presentation. Um, and we are 16 minutes to eight. So um, if you have any questions um, or concerns, now is a good time. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here and invite you all to, to come on screen so I don't feel like I'm talking into the void. <laughs>